Reading 2 takes a look at standards 1 through 7 and gives us further guidance in terms of practical life situations that we could all be facing as investment professionals. Um, the learning outcome statements are again rather clear for this one. Demonstrate the application of the code and the standards in situations involving issues of professional integrity. Um, distinguish between conduct that conforms to the code and the standards and conduct that is in breach of the code and the standards. And recommend practices and procedures designed to prevent violations of the code and the standards. Um, so, because each standard is covered, um, the same three learning outcome statements apply to all standards, from standard one all the way through to standard seven. And the typical question that you will get on this topic in the exam will be a uh, practical scenario. Um, rather than say, what is standard one, what is standard five called, and so on, the most typical ethics question would involve a professional dilemma. Um, an individual involved in a sticky situation at work, and uh, we would be given choices as to the best course of behavior that is the most ethical and in conformity with the code and the standards. So, let's start out with standard one, knowledge of the law. Members and candidates must understand and comply with all applicable laws, rules, and regulations, including the code and the standards, plus of any government, regulatory organization, licensing agency, or professional association governing their professional activities. Uh, in other words, not knowing the relevant rules and regulations uh, that, may be, uh, that you may have breached is not an acceptable defense against that kind of behavior. Uh, where there is a conflict between the code and the standards, uh, the requirement for the members and the candidates is to comply with the more strict law, rule, or regulation. So, uh, for example, according to the code and the standards, trading on material non-public information, trading on inside information is, uh, uh, is, uh, is prohibited, uh, but there may be um, a country without any insider trading laws and regulations. Um, in that case, clearly, the code and the standards is the higher standard to be upheld, and the members must follow the code and the standards. Members and candidates must not knowingly participate or assist in and must dissociate from any violation of such laws, rules, and regulations. So, uh, this is quite clear. Um, and there are uh, uh, oftentimes a lot of uh, practice questions and so on that, that are on this subject as well. Um, uh, if we are, uh, uh, we are aware that uh, there is behavior going on within our firm that is against the code and the standards, what is the best course of behavior? Uh, the first thing to do is to stop your direct involvement in the behavior or the conduct that is in breach and secondly, to dissociate yourself from the violation. However, the code and the standards usually do not require you to become a whistleblower and go to the authorities and, uh, and, and, and make a big, ca big, uh, big, big case um, about, the, the, about any minor breach. So the first requirement is that you shouldn't knowingly participate in any behavior or conduct that is against the code and the standards. And, as, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and on top of that, you should dissociate yourself from that situation. You are no longer associated with a group of people uh, that are participating in that type of behavior. Um, so, a little bit of guidance on this. Um, let's take a look at the relationship between the code and the standards and the applicable law. Uh, the basic rule here is that you got to follow the stricter of either the applicable law or the code and the standards. Um, you must comply with applicable law or regulations related to professional activities. In other words, not following the rules of the land, as they were, uh, of the country that you work in um, is not only a breach of the, uh, of the rules and regulations of that country, it is automatically also a breach of the CFA Institute code and the standards. You must not engage in conduct that would constitute a violation of the code, uh, code and the standards, even though it may otherwise be legal. So even though behavior might be legal, if it is unethical, if it's in breach of the code and the standards, uh, you are not to go ahead with that activity. And in the absence of any applicable law or regulation, um, you must adhere to the code and the standards. It's saying exactly the same thing as we said in the first line. Um, if the code and the standards are stricter 
than applicable laws and regulations that, again, you must adhere to the code and the standards. Secondly, what if you realize that there is behavior within the firm that you work in uh, uh, that would constitute a breach of the code and the standards? Well, first off, you are responsible for violations in which you knowingly participate or assist. And if you do believe that there is unethical activity going on that is against the code and the standards, first, you should dissociate or separate yourself from that activity. Stop participating. In very severe cases, this may even require that you leave employment in that firm, but that's, that's rather rare. And after you dissociate yourself from the situation, uh, you must notify your employer about your concerns. And what we mean by the employer is your direct supervisor. You notify your direct supervisor uh, about uh, the behavior that you find, uh, the, 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 the behavior that you're not comfortable with. And um, the CFA Institute strongly encourages further reports of violations by members, but it's not, it's not a requirement. Continuing with the um, uh, knowledge of the law and, and the regulations, you should be mindful of where your products are being sold. And as a supervisor, you should understand applicable laws and regulations of countries or regions of origination. That doesn't require us to be experts in compliance. However, it does require us to have a good fundamental understanding of all rules and regulations that are relevant to the type of business that we're doing. And as a member, you should undertake necessary due diligence when transacting cross-border business, uh, when you are selling products, when you are trying to recruit clients in other countries and so on. You need to make sure that you are aware of the ramifications of this in terms of compliance. So, recommendations for complying with Standard 1. Stay informed about rules and regulations, ideally by also participating in a continuing education program. Uh, regularly review procedures of compliance, maintain current files um, uh, uh, that show us what the relevant statutes, rules, regulations, and important cases are. Uh, these don't have to be in paper format. These can, of course, be electronic. Um, you also need to be aware of the rules and regulations in areas where your products are being distributed. And if in any doubt, seek legal counsel, seek the advice of compliance professionals if you don't know uh, the ramifications of any action. Um, dissociate yourself from any situation where a breach is occurring. In extreme cases, this may require you to resign your position. However, in most cases, uh, just dissociating yourself from the particular product or service or that team should be sufficient. Recommendations for firms are that they should develop and adopt a code of ethics. Um, they should provide information to their employees on applicable laws, and they should establish written protocols for reporting suspected violations of laws, regulations, and company policies. In other words, they should have clear escalation policies. So, we now move on to Standard 1B, Independence and Objectivity. Members and candidates must use reasonable care and judgment to achieve and maintain independence and objectivity in their professional activities. Um, you must not offer, solicit, or accept any gift, benefit, compensation, or consideration that reasonably could be expected to compromise your own or another's independence and objectivity. Now, keep in mind that the second line here is not a blanket ban on receiving of any kind of gifts or presents and so on. However, uh, the gifts and the presents shouldn't be so large as to influence uh, somebody's uh, decision-making, influence somebody's behavior. So, for buy-side clients, by that we mean asset managers, pension funds, and the like, um, there is um, a pressure 
on a sell side analyst. You exert for the sell side analyst to publish a report one way or the other. As portfolio managers, you have a responsibility to respect and foster intellectual honesty of sell side research. You shouldn't exert undue pressure. Um, you should not accept gifts, entertainment, or travel funding that may be perceived as impairing your decision and objectivity. Now, if you are working in sell-side research, if you are working as a research analyst at an investment bank, for example, you may be under pressure to issue favorable research reports on companies that are current or prospective investment banking clients, and that is very much against the code and ethics. Um, managers of investment banks have a responsibility provi to provide an environment in which analysts are neither coerced nor enticed into misleading research. All research reports should be independent and objective. Now, analysts may be pressured also to issue favorable reports by companies that they cover. Um, that pressure could also come from the company directly. And the recommendation here is that analysts should perform due diligence when conducting research. They shouldn't rely on rumors. They shouldn't rely on just the information directly from the company. They should verify uh, all facts um, uh, before they make it a part of their research. With regards to credit, ra uh, credit rating agency opinions, um, analysts should ensure that procedures are in place to prevent undue influences from a sponsoring company. This is especially the case uh, for uh, paid ratings, where the company pays a fee uh, to be assigned a credit rating by uh, the credit rating agency. Uh, especially in those cases, it is of utmost importance that the analysts are not feeling that they are under pressure to issue a more favorable, higher credit rating. Now, in sell side as well, there may be cases of issuer paid research where a company pays money to analysts for them to cover them uh, and issue uh, uh, periodic reports on that company. Uh, now, this is an area that is fraught with potential conflicts, just like paid for credit ratings. Investors may be misled into thinking that the research is from an independent source, but it isn't 100% independent because the research is being paid for by the subject of the research. Uh, the best practice here for companies that engage in issuer paid research is uh, to charge a flat fee for covering a company. Um, and that fee, under no circumstances, should be based on what kind of, um, uh, what kind of uh, final recommendation the analyst comes up with, whether it's a strong buy or a sell, and so on. Um, for analysts covering companies, it is highly recommended that they use commercial transportation uh, when they are traveling. Commercial transportation should be paid for by their own employers. Uh, imagine a case, for example, where uh, you are covering an oil company and the, uh, what, as part of your research, you are supposed to go and see one of the installations in the North Sea for extracting oil. Well, the recommendation is that the whole thing, if at all possible, should be paid for by your own employer and you should use commercial transportation to get there, say a flight by uh, British Airways to Aberdeen. However, going from Aberdeen to the installation in the North Sea may not be possible through commercial transportation. In those cases, uh, it is acceptable to uh, use, for example, uh, a helicopter that is owned by the company to get you there. So, regarding professionalism, which is uh, standard 1C, uh, recommendations for compliance, protecting integrity of opinions, there should be policies stating that every research report reflects the unbiased opinion of the analyst. Other recommendations include creating restricted lists if the firm is unwilling to disseminate adverse opinions, then firms should be removed from the research universe. So a company that is placed on a restricted list is a company on which research will not be published either permanently or temporarily due to conflicts of interest. Um, it is also recommended that um, uh, special cost arrangements are restricted. So again, like we mentioned before, members should pay for commercial transportation and hotel charges directly through their employer. 
air trans transportation should not be reimbursed by the corporate issuer. And use of corporate aircraft should only be used when it is not possible to use commercial transportation, like the example that we have been talking about just previously um, uh, with the North Sea oil installation. Um, gifts are not bound outright. However, they should be limited to token items. Customary, ordinary business-related entertainment is acceptable, such as business lunches and so on, provided that it's not designed to influence the member. And firms should consider placing a strict value limit for acceptable gifts based on local or regional customs. The CFA Institute doesn't place a limit um, because those numbers may be different from one country to the other, from one employer to the other. Um, uh, however, uh, firms are recommended uh, to establish those limits themselves. Further procedures for compliance. Restricting investments um, that employees can participate in, especially when it's related to IPOs. Firms should require prior approval of participation by any employees in IPOs. And there should be limits that are imposed on uh, acquiring securities in private placements, not just IPOs. The procedures should be reviewed regularly. Um, another recommendation is a policy of independence. This is a formal written policy um, that guarantees that research should be independent and objective. Um, it ensures that research analysts um, do not report to and are not controlled by any department that could compromise their independence. Um, a classic case example here would be uh, the equity research team, for example, and the uh, investment banking arm of the same company uh, that is trying to recruit a company for um, a secondary offering. There are very clear conflicts of interest. Um, if the um, equity research analysts issue an unfavorable report on the company, then the investment bankers could lose investment banking business. Um, if you have an independence policy, that means that the analysts are required to publish their opinions independently and objectively uh, whilst ignoring all other conflicts of interest that may exist. Uh, it is also recommended that firms appoint an officer that is responsible for reviewing ethics and compliance. We now move on to standard 1C, which is the standard on misrepresentation. Uh, the basic standard is that members and candidates must not knowingly make any misrepresentations relating to investment analysis, recommendations, actions, or other professional activities. Um, the recommendations are that each member must understand the limits of their firm's or their own capabilities. Uh, you need to be accurate and complete in presenting information. Not, you shouldn't omit important facts. And it is also recommended that firms provide guidance for employees making written or oral presentations. Um, a further recommendation is that in any presentation, um, uh, a list of the firm's available services and the description of the firm's qualifications is also provided. Firms can specifically designate which employees are authorized to speak on behalf of the firm uh, and which, which, which ones are not, uh, because speaking on behalf of the firm requires further training in terms of what is an appropriate uh, uh, thing to say, what is, uh, what, is, uh, what is not a misleading thing to say, and so on. Um, each member should provide a summary of their qualifications and experience when they're making presentations and making recommendations, as well as a list of services that they are capable of performing, for example, equity research. Um, any outside information that is used in the research should be verified. And... It is also requ required that uh, firms regularly monitor web pages to ensure that the information that, the, that is contained there is accurate and up-to-date. And to make sure that all reasonable precautions have been taken to protect the website's integrity, confidentiality, and security. Standard 1 also covers plagiarism. 
and the recommendations for complying with the plagiarism policy of the code and the standards is first to maintain copies of all research reports and any information relied on in preparing the research report and to attribute quotations. So attribute any direct quotations to the original source and this is inclusive of uh, 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 the projections, tables that you may have used in your research that comes from others, statistics that you may have used, again, that comes from, it comes from other sources, model or product ideas, and new methodologies. Now, keep in mind that this is not required for recognized financial and statistical reporting services. So as an example of that, if the price data that you are using for stock research comes from Bloomberg, that is uh, something that everybody knows, everybody has access to it in the investment profession, uh, it is widely available information, you don't necessarily need to attribute that. Attribute summaries, you need to attribute uh, to their sources, any paraphrases or summaries of material prepared by others. Uh, just paraphrasing something doesn't uh, revoke the necessity to uh, place an attribution to reference the material that you have used. Now, one thing here before we move on to 1D is research that is done within your own firm. So if, for example, we have two analysts, Jack and Jill, and they are both working in the same firm, and Jack uses some of Jill's work in coming up with his investment recommendations that does not need to be cited and referenced because Jill's work is the copyrighted property of Jill's employer and, well, Jill's employer is the same as Jack's employer. Now, within the firm, there may be policies preventing the, uh, the, the, the making this, uh, making this, um, uh, 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 banning this kind of practice. But according to the code and the standards, if you are using any research that is done by somebody else working for the same company as you, that does not need to be referenced because that material belongs to the company rather than the person that has prepared it. Moving on. Uh, we have standard 1D, which is a standard on misconduct. Members and candidates must not engage in any professional conduct involving dishonesty, fraud, or deceit, or commit any act that reflects adversely on their professional reputation, integrity, and competence. Um, what are the recommended procedures for compliance here? Um, companies should have code of ethics that every employee should subscribe to. And it should be made clear that inappropriate personal behavior will not be tolerated by the firm. Uh, it is also recommended that firms disseminate a list of potential violations and associated disciplinary sanctions to all employees. For example, not providing sufficient citation, referencing your work um, in, in, in a research project, what is the sanction associated with that? Um, accepting a gift from a client that is too large, what is the sanction associated with that? Um, there, uh, it is also recommended that uh, firms check references of potential employees to make sure that they are of good character and are eligible to work in the investment industry.